Let's continue our study of the transport layer here by looking at the issues of multiplexing and demultiplexing. Now these actually happen in all layers of the protocol stack, but we're gonna consider them here in the context of the transport layer. Here's how to think about demultiplexing. Think of an internet host. It's got datagrams that are arriving. These datagrams have payloads that are bound for different applications or possibly to different protocols running in that host. The process by which those payloads are directed to the appropriate application or the appropriate protocol running in that host, that's the issue of demultiplexing. Multiplexing is, is essentially the inverse of that. We learned in chapter two, for example, that many applications may be sending down through multiple sockets their application messages to TCP. TCP is going to be taking those messages and then funneling them down into, into IP. That's the process of multiplexing. Now, again, we're gonna look at this primarily in the context of TCP and UDP, but again, this is a more general topic that occurs in all layers of the protocol stack. Here's the setting. In the scenario, we've got an HTTP server in the middle here, and this HTTP server is going to be sending HTTP messages over to the client over on the left-hand side. Now, of course, this client has many applications running. We see a Skype application, a Netflix application, and of course, we've got an HTTP web browser there. And so the question we wanna ask ourselves is, how among all those applications when a message is sent from the server to the client, that that information is actually demultiplexed up to the web browser and not to any of the other applications running on the client. And we also have to think about demultiplexing at the server, where multiple clients may be sending HTTP messages back to the server. These messages may need to be demultiplexed up to different processes at the server, each of which are responsible for communicating back to the client. How is that done? Well, we're all familiar with multiplexing and demultiplexing from things that happen in our daily lives. Highways are a good example of that. In many cases, we have multiple on-ramps where cars are being multiplexed on to the highway. And of course, at big interchanges, we're demultiplexed off of, off of a highway onto a number of different possible exit ramps. Maybe an even better example is what happens when we get to an airport, for example. You arrive and immediately, well, if you have business class, you go here, economy class, you go over here. When you get to pre-check, if you have TSA pre-check, you go to the left, otherwise you go to the right. And once you get to the gate, of course, there's a place where you line up for premium class service and there are multiple coach class service lines as well. That notion of being directed, being split and being directed to a particular class of service, that's sort of at the very core of what demultiplexing is all about. So let's continue on here and let's actually look at this now in an internet context, of course, and take a look at what happens in UDP. So here we have our three host scenario again. And in this particular example, we're actually showing the processes that are going to be communicating as well as those sockets, those little yellow rectangles there with the white in the middle showing where buffers actually are. And so in this example, P1 and P3 are gonna be communicating and P2 and P4 are going to be communicating. Let's see how that's done. Well, on the, on the multiplexing side, if we look at the host in the center, we see that P1 and P2 are gonna be sending down through their sockets through the transport layer. Transport layer is going to have to multiplex data coming in from P1 and P2, take that data, put it into segments, and add information into the transport header that's going to be used for later demultiplexing. Now, when packets and datagrams are actually received uh, at that host in the center, we're gonna have to perform the, the dual operation there, the demultiplexing operation, and in that case, uh, the transport layer is going to be using header information to deliver the contents of the received segments up to the correct socket. Okay, so let's take a deeper dive into how demultiplexing works. Remember, when a host receives an IP datagram, each datagram has a source IP address, the IP address of the sender of the datagram. It's also got a destination IP address, and that's actually the host where we're actually doing this processing. Each datagram also carries one transport layer segment, and in the transport layer segment, there's a header, and we're gonna be interested in two fields within the header of the transport layer segment. 
for, for our purposes here, and that's the source port number and the destination port number. And the host is going to use the IP addresses and the port numbers to direct the segment to the appropriate socket. And we're gonna see that this is a little bit different in TCP than it is from UDP. UDP is simpler, so let's start there. Okay, in order to now understand how UDP connectionless demultiplexing works, we're gonna to have to remember a little bit about what we learned in chapter two. And remember there when we were looking at socket programming, you recall that when creating a socket, an application programmer has to specify a host local port number. Here's a code fragment here where the datagram socket is being created and there's a host local port number 12534 that's specified. Now, when creating a datagram that's actually gonna now be sent into a socket, we have to specify where that datagram is destined. And there we specify the destination IP address and the destination port number, not the local host port number. Now, over on the receiving side, when the receiving host receives the UDP segment, it's going to check the destination port number and direct the UDP segment to that socket associated with that port number. That's the act of demultiplexing there. Now, you may think for a second and say, well, wait a second, we can have multiple clients sending datagrams to the same UDP port number at a destination. If that happens, the UDP datagrams with the same destination port number, even though they're coming from different source IP addresses and maybe different source uh, port numbers, these are going to be directed to the same socket at the receiving host because that demultiplexing only happens in the case of UDP on the basis of the destination port number. Let's now take a look at an example of UDP demultiplexing. We've got our three hosts as usual. On the left-hand side, we have process P3, which has created a datagram socket with local port number 9157. On the right-hand side, we have process P4, which has created a datagram socket with a local port number 5775. And in the middle, we've got process P1, which has a datagram socket with an associated port number of 6428. Now, P1 and P3 will be communicating with each other P1 and P4 will be communicating with each other. In the first example here, we see datagrams being exchanged from P1 to P3 and from P1 back to P3. Let's look at what P1 is sending to P3 and in particular, focus here on the source port number and the destination port number of the datagram shown at the bottom of the figure here. The source port number, 9157, is the port number associated with the socket being used by the sender, by the source. The destination, well, that's being destined to port 6428, which is the port number associated with the datagram socket of process P1 in the middle. Now what happens when P1 replies back to P3? Well, we learned in chapter two uh, that the destination port number 9157, that was taken from the source port number from the datagram at the bottom, the arriving datagram to which the return datagram is a reply. So we see the destination port of the uh, uppermost of the two datagrams on the left has a destination port number of 9157 and the source port number of 6428, which again is the port number associated with the datagram socket uh, for P1. Well, on the right-hand side, we don't specify what the destination and source port numbers are. See if you can figure that out for yourselves. It's really the mirror of what's happening on the left-hand side. Well, that's how multiplexing and demultiplexing happens in UDP. Now let's take a look at TCP, where we'll see that the decisions are a little bit more complicated. Well, in the case of UDP, we saw that demultiplexing was really pretty simple. In the case of TCP, it's connection-oriented. That means we've got a sending side and a receiving side. And how are we gonna identify the sender and the receiver? Well, certainly on the basis of the IP address, but also on the basis of the sending port number and the receiving port number. So a TCP socket, when we instantiate a TCP socket, it's going to be identified by a four tuple. The source IP address, the source port number, that's on the sending side, the destination IP address, and the destination port number, that's going to be on the receiving side of the connection. 
Now, so when we do demultiplexing, the receiver is going to use all four values in this four tuple to direct a segment to the appropriate socket. We'll look at an example in just a second. Let's, let's wrap up here just by noting that a server can have uh, many simultaneous TCP sockets. Each socket is going to be identified by its own four tuple, and each socket is going to be associated with a different connecting client, client process. Our TCP demultiplexing example here has again our familiar three hosts, except this time in the center, we've got an Apache HTTP server that's going to be exchanging HTTP messages over TCP with the host on the left-hand side, which has IP address A, or the host on the right-hand side, which has IP address C, and the address of the HTTP server is B. Let's take a look now at the communication that's happening between process P3, running on host A on the left-hand side, and process P4, running in the Apache server. In a datagram flowing from left to right, we see the source IP address associated with that datagram, of course, is A, that's the sender of the datagram, the IP address of A, and the source port number is 9157. That's actually the port number, the local port number associated with the socket that P3 has created. What's in the destination field there? Well, the destination IP address is B, that's the IP address of the Apache server, and the port number is 80. And you may recall that 80 is the port number associated with HTTP service. Let's now look at a reply coming back from P4 back to P3. Here we see the source IP address is B, the port number is 80, the destination, of course, is IP address A, and the destination port number is 9157. We're also showing here on the right-hand side uh, two datagrams that are flowing from host C to the HTTP server, the Apache web server, in the middle here. And so take a look at the field values there. Hopefully those are gonna make, uh, make sense to you. The one thing we really wanna highlight here though is let's look at the three datagrams that are all arriving to the HTTP server in the middle. Notice that the destination port number in all three of these datagrams here is 80. That's absolutely critical. Remember with UDP, we would have demultiplexed just on the basis of that destination port ID. In the case of TCP, because it's connection oriented, remember we demultiplex on the four tuple and each of those four tuples of those three messages arriving are unique. So those are gonna be demultiplexed correctly to P4, P5, and P6. Well, that wraps up our study of multiplexing and demultiplexing. So let's just recap what we learned. We learned that that process of demultiplexing at the transport layer is really that question of deciding what is the socket to which we need to take the segment payload and then deliver into that socket. In the case of multiplexing, we saw that both TCP and UDP need to be able to take data from multiple sockets and then deliver that, put that in segments, and then deliver that down to the network layer below it. We saw that in the case of UDP, that demultiplexing is made on the basis of simply the destination port number, and we saw that in TCP, it's done on the basis of a, of a four tuple. And then finally, we learned that multiplexing and demultiplexing happens in all layers of the protocol stack. So we're gonna see this again when we get to the network layer and also when we get to the link layer.